Statistics is all about the interpretation of data. So we are going to take a look today at the question, how is statistical data collected? And first, we have to really understand what we mean when we talk about data. Data can be measured on several different levels. So let's take a look at the levels of measurement. Levels of measurement start with the most simple type of data and grow to the most complex type of data. It's important we know what we're working with so we make sure we can do the correct mathematical operations of it and make sense of our conclusions. The most foundational level of measurement is what is called nominal, which basically just means we put things into categories. You might say there are no numbers. So for some examples of nominal categories, you could look at color. Or maybe a yes-no survey. Do you support this political issue? Or maybe some type of label or gender. Those are nominal categories. Now, slightly more involved than a nominal category is something that we can actually put in order and say this one is more than that one, which is more than that one. We call this ordinal data. And that's data that can be put in order. However, with that order, there is no clear space between the data values. In other words, we can say A comes before B, but we don't really care how much before B. The space between A and B might be different than the space between B and C. An example of ordinal data might be finishing place in a race. There's a clear first, second, and third, but the space between first, second, and third is not necessarily well defined. That's ordinal. Or we might say the top five cooks in America. Cook one, two, three, four, and five. That's ordinal. We can put them in order, but we don't necessarily know how much better each one is than the other. Now, when we do clearly define the space between values, we have what we call interval data. Interval data has a space between the numbers with meaning. The space has meaning. However, there still is no 0 point. The space between uh, the two numbers is well defined, like in the example of temperature. Thirty degrees is ten more than twenty degrees, just like ninety degrees is ten more than eighty degrees. That space has meaning. And while temperature does have a zero, zero degrees doesn't mean the absence of temperature or no temperature. It's just a point along the number line that has the same spacing as all the other temperatures. Now, if we want to have a clearly defined zero, that's when we have ratio data. And that's where we have an absolute. 0, that means literally nothing or none. An example of ratio data might be the length of a phone call or a test score or the number of children. If we said we got a 0 on a test or we have 0 children, that actually means nothing, the lowest amount possible. Now, these different levels of measurement can show up in different types of data. Let's scroll up.
it's very important we understand the two different types of data. And the second one can actually be broken up into two subgroups. The first type of data is what is called qualitative. Qualitative data, which really focuses, again, on categories. No numbers. We're describing the qualities of something. So for example, we might be talking about the type of car, or maybe some type of ethnic group. Those are the qualities of the data. That's qualitative data. The second type is the one we work with the most in statistics, and that is what is called quantitative data. And quantitative data is when we're looking at quantities. Quantitative data is either measured or counted. Really, what we're talking about is numbers. How many, how much, how far, how long. Some examples of these might be the number of students. Or the distance to school. Quantitative data can even be divided up further. Quantitative data can be either discrete or, leave a space, continuous. Discrete data is data that is countable. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. When we count things, we say we have discrete data. Generally, we don't get decimals with discrete data. Examples might include the number of shoes a person owns. You're not going to end up with decimal shoes. You're not going to have 1.4 shoes. Discrete data is countable. You count the number of shoes there are. That's contrasted with continuous data, which is measured, which means every decimal and every decimal in between those decimals is possible. Measured data, example, might be the length of a phone call. or maybe somebody's height. That's continuous data. It's measured. Always we can have decimals. You can have half an inch. You can have half of a half of an inch or a quarter. You can have an eighth of an inch. You can do all the decimals in between. That is continuous data. So that's the different levels of measurement we can do with different types of data. But we haven't answered the question of how do we collect our data, which is what we said we wanted to do at the beginning. So let's take a look at actual sampling of data. How do we collect it? When we collect data in a sample, we want it to be representative of the entire population. In order for it to be representative of the entire op population, we need the data to be random to avoid any bias. In other words, we want all options to be equally likely to be included in our sample. So if random is best, let's take a look at a few random sampling methods. The first random sampling method is what we call simple random sampling. Simple random sampling is random selection methods such as random numbers
or drawing out of a hat. This is the idea of I assign everybody a number, and I pick a bunch of random numbers, and those people are included in my survey. An example is if I want to pick students, we could assign students a number. and pick random numbers to be included in the study. A second type of random sampling is what is called stratified random sampling. And this is when we divide the population into groups. Each group is called a strata. And then select a proportionate number. of each group. Polling is often done this way. The idea is if we randomly survey 100 people or 200 people, we don't want those 200 people to be all of the same political party. Otherwise, we would get a biased sample. So we guarantee it by saying, if my state is 40% Democrat, 35% Republican, and 25% Independent, then using a random method, we will select. I said we wanted 200 people, so maybe we double the percentages. Maybe we'd select 80 Democrats, 70 Republicans, and 50 Independents to be in included in my sample. I have a proportionate representative of each group that matches the proportions of the state, and so my sample still is random, but I don't get the bias of only interviewing one party. Another type of random sampling also involves groups, but it's called cluster random sampling. Again, we're going to divide into groups. But this time, instead of selecting a proportionate number of each group, we are going to randomly select entire groups. So everybody in some groups are included, and everybody in other groups are excluded. An example of doing this might be a football stadium. And it has different sections in the football stadium. So we're, instead of interviewing everybody in the stadium or random people through the stadium, it's easier just to hit one section at a time. So in the football stadium, sections E and G are randomly selected. And all fans from those sections are included. Cluster takes 
all people in each randomly chosen section, while stratify takes a proportionate group out of each group. The last random method we're going to use is called systematic random sampling. The idea behind systematic random sampling is we start with a random item or person. and choose every nth person after this. And that means like every fifth person, or every twelfth person, or every thirtieth person. An example of this might be if I pick a random phone book person, phone number, a random number in the phone book. And then I choose every 50th person after this until I circle back to the beginning. I go all the way through and back to the beginning and back to where I was, taking every 50th person. Those are our four random sampling methods that you should be able to identify for this course. There is a non-random method that is used quite a bit. And so we should at least acknowledge the non-random method called convenience sampling. which basically says use the results that are readily available. As an example, uh, let's say I need to collect 50 data values for a survey, so I'm just going to interview people nearby me. or maybe people within driving distance. Maybe the friends on my Facebook friend list. Something convenient and easy to get a hold of. It's not really random. And the problem with not being random is there are several drawbacks to not being random. I could have bias results. If I'm interviewing phone preference outside of the Apple Store, I'm going to get more iPhones. That convenience sampling is going to work against me. It may not be representative. Of the population. If I only interview outside of a school because it's convenient near my house, I'm going to get a lot more parents of young children than I will the general population. And then the drawback of that is the results may not be useful outside of the sample. I could conclude that such a percent of people prefer a certain type of music, but when I'm with a different sample or a different population, those results may not be useful. So those are some drawbacks to convenient sampling. We've got to watch out for convenient sampling, though it is used more often than it should be. Take a look at the homework assignment that practices with random sampling and also uh, some of these different levels of measurement and types of data. 
In class, we're going to do more work with random sampling, get really comfortable with the different types. And I'll look forward to seeing you then.